Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And today we are in the Pacific hangar to review a fighter that, you know, Greg, we actually had one of these. We'll tell the story about it and somehow it escaped us. The P-38 Lightning, like thunder and lightning, it just kind of went away. So we'll give you an idea on that. Now, Greg, of course, in his uh, Shoshin style, I was gonna say more indomitable style, you know, he picks the headgear, the deal, he picks the headgear and he picks the soda, which is another winner today. Uh, and I guess with the lightning, Greg, there's heavy weather coming. This thing feels ridiculous. I can only imagine what it looks like on camera. I'm gonna go ahead and take it off. There we go. And I'm gonna, this will be interesting. I'm tossing it off camera to the Kenny who, uh, that was a one hop, I think there, Greg. So today we're talking about the Lockheed, the P-38, the Lightning. I'm gonna give you, and Greg can throw up a uh, plan view of the airplane, but I'll give you a plan view of the aircraft. Very, very interesting American design. Now, you know, we've talked about the United States rearming during the, up to World War II, and they were doing it at a frantic pace. And the Pacific Hangar is one of the areas where I'm looking around here as I'm talking about this, and I can see the P-40, which was, you know, again, one of those uh, pre-war designs. And I can see the Wildcat. And this is another one of those kind of, we knew war was coming and we knew the technology was changing. And we were trying to get as much of an edge in the air as we could. Now, this is... The P-38 represents an American long-range fighter who was actually um, in a response to a US, U.S. Army Air Corps design a stipulation of X-608 in 1937. Greg's going to have fun with this. Now, that was for a uh, twin-engine aircraft. It was uh, also met by, met by the Valti, the XP-1015 project. Greg, you can see if you can find that in post, the Valti uh, XP-1015. The Valti was never built. This one was actually built. Now, there was another one in there, Greg, that also yielded a, a design, and we actually have a derivative aircraft of that in the collection, which was the X-609 requirement or request for a proposal, and that led to the P-39, to the Aero Cobra. So we obviously, we have a P-63, which is the would you say the bigger brother of that airplane? So the first flight of the P-38 took place in 1938. It was designed by uh, Kelly Johnson and Hall Hibbert. It was introduced in 1941. Now what's specific, of what, what is significant about that? Going to war. <laughs> These are lethal weapons. Their one purpose, the sole reason for their existence, is to knock enemy planes out of the sky. They are P-38s. They rank with the fastest and best fighters in the air today. So we had an airplane that was very fast. It was, uh, when it was um, introduced, it was one of the first aircraft, if not the first airplane, in level flight that could go 400 miles an hour. It had a very interesting exhaust or, or exhaust, a very quiet exhaust feature of this airplane. If you ever hear it go by, it has kind of a, would you say, Greg, a strum? It's not like a, that loud throaty noise, and that is because of the turbo superchargers on the airplane they actually mute the exhaust. Now, before the war was finished, Greg, over 10,000 of these aircraft were built, if you can believe that. Uh, it had on its design tree, because a lot of these aircraft had derivative designs, this evolved into the XP-49 and the XP-58 projects, neither of which went anywhere. They kind of petered out because the whole concept was, was petering out. Now. These long range, the Germans called them destroyers. And that would be the, the um, BF-110, the ME-110. Uh, you could see it, big, heavy, 
heavy fighter, and a lot of the German twin engine designs evolved into quite effective night fighters. The uh, Lightning, the twin engine Lightning was much more nimble, although it did not have in high altitude combat, it did not have as good a roll rate. So it wasn't a great, great uh, dogfighter. It just could not roll. Once uh, the propellers in the early aircraft rotated, the uh, same way when they had counter-rotating propellers, which um, basically centered the torque on the airplane. The airplane became much better. Uh, but it, early in uh, the development, it, was, it wasn't a handful to fly. It was actually pretty forgiving, but it, it just was not. If you got into a dogfight with a very nimble single-engine fighter, it was not good at that. Now we're gonna talk about, the, well people are gonna say, well what about the Pacific? We're gonna talk about the Pacific uh, in a minute because that's where this aircraft really came into its own. In high altitude dogfighting in Europe, uh, it was the primary long range fighter up until the point where the P-51Ds started coming into theater, but up against a skilled pilot in let's say uh, an FW-190, a Focke-Wulf-190, or later model, uh, the either G model, the F or the G model 109, the a pilot in this could really have his hands full. So it was, but it also evolved. This particular aircraft has rockets, so it evolved in a number of different missions. It was a, uh, it was an air-to-ground aircraft. It was also a reconnaissance airplane in, in another life in a reconnaissance airplane. It one thing about it that was really unique was it was an incredibly stable gun platform because the pilot is in between the two engines and he's got those 50s and a 20 sitting out there 20 millimeter cannon there were field mods that changed the the uh, weapon suite in the airplane and of course it had hard points could carry bombs or rockets but it was a uh, very uh, very potent weapon now let's talk about the aces in this of course there was richard bong who had uh, 40 kills. He was killed in a P-80 crash, a test, uh, a test cr uh, pilot. Uh, Tommy McGuire had 38 kills in this airplane, and Charles McDonald had 27. So he had a lot of really um, high number ki uh, kills in this airplane. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that is. And in my version, in my mind, why that was was that in the Pacific, remember we talked about the Japanese Zero, very big ailerons, uh, really good wing, light airplane, lightly constructed, it was a bantamweight fighter. And we've talked, you know, we reviewed other airplanes in context. The thing that the, Z that the P-38, obviously liquid cooled engines over water is not fun, which is why the Navy went with radials, but you got two of them, so you've increased your safety factor the airplane was a lot faster. Now the uh, combat, as opposed to the high altitude combat in Europe, was much down lower at intermediate altitudes because the zero just didn't go up that high. And this airplane, with its speed, the fact that it was a good gun platform, uh, and pilots started to play to its strengths. It, you know, they would come in, make gun runs on the zeros and then bank away, and they could leave a, a zero in the dust in this airplane, especially the later models of the aircraft. And so you had a platform against a lightly armed opponent that if you hit him with that, um, that armament package up front, what would the zero do? The zero would come apart or it would burn. And so you had a lot of kills uh, with these airplanes in the Pacific theater. As I said, it was, it was a potent airplane in the European theater, but not as much as, uh, as it didn't do as well in, the, um, in European as it did in the Pacific. Now, there were some issues with this. We're gonna come back to what it was well known for in the Pacific. This aircraft, and there's some really harrowing stories of this aircraft was the first aircraft to start to have. There were others, but not as much as this airplane in design that it had, it had compressibility problems, it had mock tuck, it had tail flutter, and those are all problems, and it had to do with this, this um, uh, 
twin tail design and the control surfaces and how the tail was built. But in short, without going too far down that rabbit hole, when you got the aircraft into a dive and you got into a speed of about uh, 0.8 Mach below the sound barrier, this airplane would start to have real control problems to the point where you get a control lock and ultimately the airplane, you, you, you wouldn't be able to pull out. The airplane would go into the ground. Now a mock tuck, you can look that up, but if you get a higher mock, what ends up happening is the nose dives, the nose pulls down, and it just accentuates the pull of the airplane down as, the, as it creates more and more speed. So it, it had some, it was fairly docile in maneuvering, but it had a couple of things, and a lot of airplanes have this, where you get them in to a certain uh, flight envelope and they'll bite you. And we've talked about that with the Sabre Dance and, and other airplanes where uh, they, you gotta remember at this time, they did not understand all of the airflow dynamics as they're getting closer and closer to the sound barrier. And as these airplanes got faster and faster, they started to run into those problems. And this, this airplane had them in spades. They solved a lot of those issues uh, as they, um, as they came up with different design versions of the aircraft, they played with the tail and the way the control surfaces were made. And so they were able to, to solve some of that, but not completely. The airplane was still squirrely uh, at, at, at the, in those dives at high speed, and they, they never quite solved any of that. They did solve the, the torque issue with the airplane when they created counter-rotating propellers. Now this did have Allison engines in it, a, a good, uh, one of those American engines did not have Rolls-Royce, then they played with different horsepowers as they changed the models. But uh, the aircraft itself uh, in this configuration didn't really change very much. The plane also had a number of firsts in it. In the Lockheed P-38 Lightning racked up an impressive series of firsts. It was the first Lockheed designed military aircraft to go into series production. It was the first twinned engine interceptor to serve with the U.S. Army Air Corps. It was the first production fighter powered by the Allison V-1710 inline engine. It was the first modern fighter equipped with a tricycle landing gear. It was the first American plane to use butt-jointed flush riveted external surfaces. It was the first to make extensive use of stainless steel. It was the first fighter to use a bubble canopy right from the start. It was the first fighter with speeds over 400 miles per hour. It was the first U.S. twin boom fighter to go into production. It was the first U.S. Army Air Force fighter to shoot down a German aircraft. It was the first U.S. Army Air Force fighter to carry out an escort mission to Berlin. It was the first U.S. Army Air Force plane to land in Japan after the country had surrendered. It was the heaviest U.S. single-seat fighter of World War II. It was the only American fighter in production at the time of Pearl Harbor to still be in production at the war's end, and it accounted for more Japanese aircraft destroyed in combat than any other U.S. fighter. It, it had a lot of firsts. Now, what is the airplane known for uh, primarily, or what, one of the things it's well known for is the Yamamoto shoot-down, where P-38s surprised uh, the uh, Yamamoto, the architect, the Japanese uh, admiral that was um, in charge of Pearl Harbor, attack on Pearl Harbor, and they shot him down. The reality of, and he was killed in the crash. The uh, reality was that the Americans had broken the Japanese naval codes, the Japanese codes, and uh, it, was, it was just a good old fashioned bushwhack, as they want to say, but they had to make it look like a fighter sweep so the Japanese didn't pick up that they had broken the codes. Some people say that the Japanese realized that they did break the codes. Other people say no, they didn't. But uh, either way, uh, Yamamoto, who was the architect of Pearl Harbor and was quite clear to the Japanese high command because he had been in the United States uh, uh, on, um, as, in, on his education and, and in early life, that he, uh, he had told the high command that he could not uh, prevail in a long drawn out war with the United States and uh, after he was um, after he was killed in that crash of course you saw the Japanese defensive perimeter in the Pacific just continue to shrink and ultimately the atomic bombs uh, and uh, dropped in Japan ended the war 
but uh, this aircraft, this weapon, is primarily known for taking out the Japanese uh, master strategist, if you will, Yamamoto. Now, we're going to go ahead and put this on back on its stick. I will try to do that without breaking it. We'll get her put back there. Now, we're going to move on to the Stage 2. The Stage 2 today... Now, I don't think this really has much to do with uh, the airplane, but it's Dr. Brown's Cell Ray, Cell Ray, Cell Ray, uh, cherry, celery soda with other natural flavors. Now, of course, it has 140 calories. It's something, uh, uh, it's got carbohydrates in it, Greg, but uh, not much sodium, so we'll see what happens here, but... Today, my toast is going to be to all of those P-38 pilots. We actually have a P-38 pilot with us still, with Blaine Mack, who's a P-38 pilot. So, Blaine, we love you. The guys that flew this airplane, there is no question that the P-38 was one of the things that changed the tide of the air war in the Pacific. There is absolutely no question, and they provided good service all the way across all of the Allied theaters of operation. So if you were a P-38 driver, I salute you. Oh, wow. That celery's been left in the field a little too long, I think, Greg. Ugh. Okay, so... I'm going to finish that. I'm going to go ahead and put this down. Now, if you want to have your friends and neighbors know how much you love Lockheed, and Greg, F-117, Lockheed, another, if you think about it, and actually we had uh, Planes of Fame brought over the P-38, and we flew the T-33 when the F-117 came in, all Lockheed products. So uh, if you want to show your love for Lockheed, Go out to the link on the video, and you can have Jason send you one of your very own Lockheed shirts. You, I have one of those, Greg. You can share the love for Lockheed. It's very, very exciting, and we want you to get out and, and do that. Now, a couple of Fred fun facts, Greg. I have, in fact, I have a plethora of Fred fun facts today. I have three of them. The P-38 was the inspiration a design inspiration for a couple of other things. Did you know that? It is. It was the uh, tail fin inspiration for the 1948 and the 1949 or 48, 49 Cadillac. Did you know that? It also was a design inspiration, and we have one of these in inventory here, the 1950 to 51 Studebaker. So it was design inspiration there. And the exciting thing, because I'm a huge Star Wars fan, is that the speeder wine in Star Wars is a combination of the P-38 engine and the P-51 engine blended together. So that is, and I'm telling you, that's one, that's a bar bet there. You can win that one. So it actually, the P-38 made it all the way in to Star Wars as an inspiration. So there is three Fred Fun Facts, Greg. Those are exciting. Now, my name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. We cannot do everything we're going to do without you. And this uh, case here has our P-38 model in it. I was going to tell you the story. Apparently, and I don't know the whole story. You can ask Steve Hinton about this. But uh, we had a P-38, and I don't know whether Steve Hinton owned the P-38 or Bob Pond on the P-38, but one of them, our founder, and one of them paid for the restoration or restored it or whatever, and a P-38 lived with us for a number of years, in fact, in this hangar, and then when that agreement was up, the P-38 went uh, back to Planes of Fame, and Planes of Fame has a flying P-38 that used to live with us for a while, but you know, you can you go on over and check out Planes of Fame on a, on a flying airplane. This is, uh, was our display when the airplane was here, and it lives on in our Pacific hangar. You can find it, but we cannot do all of these restorations and uh, these types of exhibits without your donations. So hit the link on those donations. Now, if you are a new 
viewer of the channel, we hope we earned your subscription today. Hit that subscriber button, and I learned another new phrase. Tickle that little bell there for notifications. It's not Fred Bell. Tickle that little bell so you can uh, be notified every time that we put up a new video because we refresh videos on our, on our we, do you know we have over like 400 videos on our web channel now. It's pretty amazing on our YouTube channel. But you can, uh, we hope you will uh, become a subscriber and uh, we hope that you will help us continue our mission. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.